Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Welcome to Let's Talk TCI Real Estate. It's always a pleasure to be in your home on a Thursday evening. I am excited about our conversation that's going to happen today, and I'm hoping that you are excited as I am um, as we do this show, Let's Talk TCI Real Estate. Please use an opportunity, a few minutes, just to like and share the page. Please like and share the page. Um, tag one of your friends. Tag anyone you know may be interested in what we are speaking about today, which is the subject of building construction. So today I am pleased to have with me a contractor who has worked in building and has experience working on more than one island in the Turks and Caicos. We will be discussing some general building construction details. Um, definitely, if you have any questions, please feel free to add it in the comments section while we are live. I am looking forward to this conversation, like I've said before. So for anyone who has purchased a vacant lot and is looking to build um, now or in the near future, I believe that um, this is a very good conversation and some great content will be shared today and you should be tuned in. So call anyone who you know would want to hear about building construction in the Turks and Caicos Islands. Always put your comments or questions in the comment section. Let us know where you are listening in from um, and we are here to help you with information that we have. So without any further delay, uh, because we like to be on time and we like to get right to the point, I am going to ask my guest, Mr. Herbert Swan, to please introduce yourself. And as you introduce yourself, can you please share with us just a little bit about how long you have been in the construction industry and let us know what you specialize in. Mr. Swan. Um, good evening. Thank you for having me on the show. Uh, good evening to everyone out there in social media. i um, very happy to be here, be here this evening to share with you a bit of my experience and uh, uh, a bit about my construction life. Um, I've been in the construction um, arena for, I guess, for as long as I could remember. I started out um, pretty early, I think at the age of 13, um, with my dad, my first job with him was trading at a dollar an hour. And from there, you know, as things progress, um, I finished high school and um, went right into the construction um, trade with him. Um, this was, of course, back in the Bahamas. Um, we did a lot of major construction back in the Bahamas, but Eventually, we moved back to Turks and Caicos, where we worked on many high-end homes, beachfront homes, um, worked on places like Pinnacle. Um, was one of the general um, supervisors there. We worked on the National Insurance Building in Grand Turk. Uh, worked on Parakeet, on a lot of the high-end homes there, and the spa. Um, you know, it's a long list that goes on. And, you know, to say I specialize in one particular area in the construction would be, um, I guess, not clearly speaking what, what I'm capable of doing. Because the way I was brought up in the construction arena, you have to know more than just one particular area in the construction field so that you, uh, you can, you know, police your work and a full understanding of your whole project. So there's different areas in the construction that I had to understand and learn. But if I were to say one of the things that they do, you know, I guess the engineering part of it, which is laying out of the home um, the, the lot, um, understanding the, the general engineering construction for you know, structural engineering part of it. Um, everything that comes together in making the building works, you know, you have to have an understanding of that. So,
that's basically where I'm going to be a general contractor. Great. So you're into you're a general contractor, but um, you may having expertise in many different fields within the construction business. Uh, yes, um, as I said, you know, you, you need to know that any person that really ser serious about the construction should try to understand different facets of the construction so that if you ever were to get in a situation where you have to take a on a jam to driving heavy equipment, I had to learn how to operate a backhoe, sky track, you know, those sort of things so that the production on the job site continues, you know? Totally understand. So um, basically, um, I am looking so much forward to just diving into, thank you for that introduction of, of yourself, and I'm looking forward to just diving into all of these questions that I think will be very beneficial to a lot of us um, who are listening. So I, I guess I'll ask you, how would you describe the construction climate in the Turks and Caicos Islands? Would you say that there is a lot more construction going on now compared to last year? Uh, yes, I, I do see quite a bit of building going on, especially um, people that are building um, villas, a lot of villas. Um, also, uh, um, in the local community as well, there's a lot of major construction going on. And I, I do believe that there's um, a lot in the pipeline um, that is to come. And I do believe that you will see a gradual climb with the construction build up over the next um, several months to a year or two. Okay. So do you feel like there um, are enough contractors on islands to facilitate this increase in um, building of new homes and villas that you have mentioned? Or would you say there's a shortage of contractors? We, we do have quite a bit of contractors on island. Now, there's a difference between a general contractor and someone that's doing subcontract um, sub work. We, 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 we actually left off but because we were talking about the differences between the subcontractor and the general contractors. And we were just speaking about, you know, did we, we have sufficient contractors on islands who are able to facilitate um, you know, building of residential home and villas, not just on a large development scale, but also on a small scale. If you want to use opportunity just to reiterate a little bit about what you had said about it before we got disrupted. Okay. Yeah, I was saying that um, with small family homes, we do have sufficient um, contractors on island um, to take those jobs on. Um, but I was noting to the fact that, first of all, if, if there was a major construction boom taking place right, right now in the Turks and Caicos where they had a lot of development going on, certainly we would be short staff um, with local contractors, um, you know, having sufficient staffing to, you know, actually take on parts of, of those work. Um, well, one would say, how can that be? And they just built the uh, 12 story and they had um, sufficient people there working. Well, we had local contractors and we had imported contractors as well. But what I was iterating um, and the fact that in building even homes locally, um, you know, a lot of our contractors can build, but they still have like, you know, most um, persons probably go to the bank mm -hmm. to, to, you know, but the banks, they also demand um, insurance bond as well. And also um, in terms of the person that does the quantity, you have two companies on island, BCQS and construction advisory that the banks deal with. Sometimes, um, and I know this is a, a way 
off a bit from the question that you asked, but I wanted to say this because this is important, that a lot of times, a lot of our contractors try to do the quantity themselves just to get the job. And so they would send it a bit to the bank, not understanding that if they take the contract on, that agreement says that you have to finish the house or whatever building that you're doing. And sometimes they leave and hardly their shirt on their back because they do it just to get the work as opposed to getting the right um, advice and the proper um, direction from, from these companies um, that does the quantity. And so a lot of our local, it's not that our local contractors can't build, but some of them are ill-advised and the right way to go about it. And so um, some of them might be omitted not being qualified to actually go and do it when it comes to the banks, you know? Okay. Um, can I just ask, because you were talking about the quantity surveyors at BCQS Construction Advisory, et cetera. So are mm -hmm. you saying that um, the banks is looking for them to, if you are going through the bank for a construction loan, the bank is the, looking at those companies to do the estimate on the cost of the finished work? Most times um, the banks look at those two companies um, to do quantity and also to do surveys on valuation on land and that kind of thing. Because those are the recognized companies um, in the country that the banks deal with. But I was saying that a lot of times um, a lot of local contractors try to take on jobs and try to do the work themselves. Just to, and sometimes they under bid the job or underprice the job just so they can do it right. and they can't do the work. Right. So it's best to you have to price it right to make sure you can complete the project in its entirety. Yeah. Okay. I understand yeah. that. So let me ask you this, since the pandemic, um, what would you say um, probably are, were some of the challenges that contractors um, have faced or are still facing? You know, like, I guess, like, I've heard a lot about delays in shipment of materials. Can you elaborate a little bit more about some of these challenges? Well, you know, I've done work where, even from um, the time of, of Irma, we had some challenges of getting um, material on um, on island. Um, there were delay time because of, um, I guess, people, you know, the companies being overbooked. Um, since the pandemic, they've had they've been short staff. You know, a situation that's been happening out in California, where a lot of um, boats were just docked out to sea, and people are not turning up to work. So it's been. Um, hard for many subcontractors, um, even to the point where if you went to Miami to do your own pricing and, and do your own buying, sometimes getting it to the island is not so easy. So what I found out the easiest way to deal with that would be to actually go to the major uh, material companies on island like KB Home and do it center and let them do it. Because um, certainly they're the ones that are more recognized and they would certainly be able to get their stuff in much more easier than you or I would. So yeah, it's been difficult, but those who have their ties with persons in the States that can do their pickup, they somehow get their stuff in, but the easiest way to go would be to use one of the companies on island to do your shopping. Right. And does this apply? Are you just saying like just for a general basic home or villa, um, this is probably the easiest way to go versus a development, a larger scale development, um, then sourcing your own material versus going through one of the companies here on, yeah. on island. Right. The much bigger developments, of course, they would have their, um, their base set up in the States or wherever they're getting the stuff from and, you know, um, they would have an easier time because of the large quantity that you're dealing with, get stuff shipped in, you know, they're spending the big money. Okay. So, yeah. So would you say this is just one of the main challenges that you're seeing since the pandemic, just the delay in shipment because of the situation? Yeah. Um, yes, that's been one of the situations, but, you know, since the pandemic as well, I've seen a tremendous rise in cost of 
um, material as well. Um, you know, a sheet of plywood now, um, red edge plywood as much as, as can cost as much as $110 a sheet. You know, um, I was comparing prices with some of the receipts I had just three years ago comparing with now and, and it's, it's almost scary for somebody that's trying to build your first home when they look at what it's going to cost and they might decide to think twice about doing it. But, you know, that's just the way life is and we have to work with, with what we have right now. Right. So basically, I, I mean, by you saying that, it makes me feel like, say, for example, I if I decide just I want to build my first home, I need to consider the real size of my building. Don't try to just build something elaborate for the sake of having a big building, but just try to find something that's comfortable and affordable when I'm building because of the cost of higher cost of construction. Yeah, you have to be realistic in building. And, and, and you know, first of all, um, know which, what it is that you want to build, why you're building it. And, um, for instance, um, at one point, you know, the building for square foot cost was around $280 to maybe $325 a square foot some time ago. And right now, that price is now up to $500 a square foot. And that's not a really high end spec house. It's just that the cost of everything has gone up. Um, there are, are companies that are billing as high as $1,200 a square foot. But of course, the cost per square foot depends on the specs of the house. If that's a standard house, you probably can get away with certain things. If, like for instance, let me use it for example. Um, you could be doing a house and the front door might be say $8,000. So you're not priced at a house the same as if you were just putting in a door that was $800 or $1,000. So um, in building, the person that's doing it have to have a real clear understanding of what it is that they want um, and not try to do things that later on they change their mind because there's something called um, a change order in construction where companies charge you for changing something right in the middle of the construction. Oh, I don't like where this is going. I want to change this. I want to do this. And that can add up too. You know, that could be the difference between another five to 10 grand because you're not certain of what you want. So I often say to clients, before you say, let's go, or let's get the project moving, take some time to really make sure everything that you want to do is the way it is settled to be. Because later on, once you start changing stuff up, um, it will cost. Now, a lot of small contractors on island, um, they sometimes they have what I call sympathy with, with, with a client and they would do certain things and they won't make a fuss about it. But you don't get away with that with the, the big companies because they have overheads that um, that's included in their charges. So. Right, because like you say, making changes while you're in the project can increase costs as well as it can increase delays. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. So I do like what you're saying about, you know, making sure this is what you are doing and moving ahead with the plan instead of trying to change the plan midway of right. construction. Sometimes people right. don't think about that. Mm hmm. And I also, you talked about a square footage of $500 per square feet. You know that it does, it is a lot when you start thinking about it, because if I'm thinking about building just a simple, I'm just using for easy calculation, uh, 1,000 square feet home, I can be looking at spending $500,000 easily just for that home. You know, and I know you did say the per square foot depends on um, other things. Like you mm -hmm. say, um, you know, if you're getting the bells and whistles, like a high end door versus um, mm -hmm. a small regular door, I understand that. But just for, you know, easy calculation, like I said, $500,000, I mean, $500 per square foot is a lot of money. And so you have to think carefully about what you are building 
Um, so when you move forward, you can try to um, alleviate any additional charges that may come along with the process. What would, what would you say the cost of um, a three bedroom and the second phase going for right now? Uh, well, currently we have three bedrooms that are going for around $290,000. Second phase? In phase, yes. That was one of the last sales that come around that type price range. Yeah. Now, I, remem I remember when they were selling for well, like 170000 Right. So I'm just using that for an example how much the price prices have gone up. Okay. Right. Now, if if you have somebody that's gonna that want to do you a favor, I would I often say to some people you know who want to build, find a contractor who's willing to work with you. This is your budget, you know. Um, and realistically, you shouldn't be trying to build a house for one hundred fifty thousand dollars. That that's not gonna work. Right. I mean, not 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 at today's um, cost, but you can probably get something decent for say 250, 280. That's probably a little more elaborate than something you would buy in phase two. Okay, but you have to find a contractor who's willing to work with you and um, willing to bite the bullet on certain things. But you have to be realistic. realistic and with what, what is that you're looking for? Some people want um, $10,000 cabinets, you know, that kind of thing wouldn't work. You have to, and, and there's a way to do it, you know. There's a way that you can have a really nice home, but, you know, I, I don't know, I, I won't say that here. I, I don't want to put other contractors at a, at a you know, mm -hmm. but there's a way that you can have some bells and whistles at a very affordable price. So basically, um, it's, a, it's a real conversation to have a jail building contractor just to make sure that he is able to help you to get that product at an affordable mm -hmm. price without, right. without being a detriment to the project and making sure it's at a high quality. Yes. Okay. So um, just talking about building, what's an estimated building time frame just for whom would you say? Uh, well, again, that depends on the size. Um, let's say an average home of um, 2,500 square feet, depending on availability of material, uh, normally runs between five and nine months. Okay. okay. But I've done homes that are on that sort of high end side that two months done everything but we're talking about you know having money there and and of course these homes is done um they're not laid blocks we do something called reinforced poured concrete so everything is solid when when we do the form work everything is in, is already installed in all the piping for electrical and plumbing and whatever else so when you do your pour and you remove the form, your building is up. By the time your form is removed, the roof is ready to go on. Mm -hmm. And you know, everybody who has a certain part to play in building that house, um, they're in position, you know? So yeah, you can build a house in a time, timely manner, because most time, any client, what they're looking for is, you know, delivery time, but they also want quality and precision on your work. And so I wouldn't suggest if you don't know how to do it, people just rush somebody work out and say, um, we're gonna try and get it out because you can make mistakes. The time frame depends on your qualification or your ability to deliver, to deliver what you say you can deliver to your client um, as a good product. Right. So, and, and, and I like what you said before, the time frame also depends on the size of the work that needs to be done, the, the, how, how readily available the material is and the labor mm -hmm. is to get it done. 
Because if you have to think about, like we're talking about shipment delays, this can extend the time period of getting it done if you don't have all your materials on the ground. Precisely. Right. Okay, so those are things we have to consider. But but barely we can get a home in a timely um in a moderate time frame mm -hmm. generally. So what you say, I mean, what does also apply for um construction on the outer islands? Same procedure, same time frame in terms of building, other than with the lag in time of getting shipment in? Well, let's say for instance, um the cost of building a house in North Cake is certainly low be different than the cost of building in Provo. Um, yep. Can you elaborate and, a little bit on that? Okay. Um, first of all, you have to get the materials over to North Caicos. Um, there's, there's a delivery time of getting it to the dock from wherever you have to get the materials from and then shipping it over on Lewis Barge or whoever taking it over and then you have to take it from there to where it has to go. Um, it might be Middle Caicos. You know, depends on where, where it is that you have to build, but certainly just because of um, commuting over there, there's a cost to, to that as well. Um, and then, you know, you also can run into some problems with getting materials over there in a timely manner as well, because we don't have a road as such where you can just drive over. You have to depend on the barge and we, we have to, you know, hope that they have us on their schedule time frame that, that we can, because there are other people billing as well, you know, so there's just certainly different um, situations that can change um, a time frame of doing anything on, a, on an other island. Yeah. Right. Yeah, but what I'm yeah definitely what I'm gathering from you, like you said, it's it's the shipment. This is most of the delay in terms yes. of construction and time. Yes. Oh, I totally understand that. So let me ask you this: for someone who's looking to build, can you explain the process from start to finish? So, for example, like the minute someone contacts you, what happens? Then do you give them a quote? Is there a deposit required? Is there a payment structure? Can you just elaborate a little bit? So to guide someone who's new at this, how do we go about you know, this whole process? Okay, can I, can I give you two scenarios? Um, sometimes someone would approach me and say, well, I wanna build a house. I would ask, okay, do you have drawings? No. Um, do you have an idea what it is that you wanna build? Um, they would sometimes do some little block sketches and say, well, I want the bedroom here, I want the kitchen, I want that. So they, they kind of interpret in their head what it is that they want, but they can't really define that on paper. So that's something that's really visual. So for somebody in that situation, I would say, okay, um, let's sit down and discuss, first of all, uh, what size are you looking at? What is your budget? What is it that you think you want? Because if they say, well, I want to go to the bank, then they need to know how much money they want to borrow from the bank that they can afford to pay a mortgage on. Okay. So there's a bit of consultation going on with that so that you, um, you kind of get a feel to know if they fully understand what it is that they're getting into. So I would say, okay, let me bring in my architect, sit with you, um, and then they would begin to put a composite, um, composite sketch together to say, okay, is this what you're looking for? Sorry, can now, we pick a pin right there? I'm sorry, I hope I don't um, change your thoughts, but like you said, bring in your architect. So basically, um, you as a, as a contractor, you have an architect work with you. Do many contractors have architects who work alongside with them, or is this something special or specific to you and your and your? Um, well, I believe that a lot of the bigger con construction companies probably have their own architects and and those architects. Um, let me say this without saying too much. Um, 
the position I'm in right now and, one of, and the people I work with, uh, we have a house office full of, with over 400 architects and engineers in their office. Um, so I have people to elaborate in any areas that I would go at, but I do have a personal architect that I've worked with on many projects that I can call and say, I need you to put together um, some construction um, sketches that a client need to look at. I want them to look at to say, you know, this is something that they want to go with or not. So I think that's important depending on how soon you're trying to get a project out to have somebody in your corner to do that, you know? Right, and I, I, and I also ask that because it's, like you said, that it's important also because you have now, you're associated with an architect that uh, you understand their work, they understand the way you work. And so you yeah. mash well together to get a finished product. Because I've right. heard it, some, you know, some people like, they don't want, I mean, just generally, you have some contractors who don't want to build based on what um, an architect, certain architect would have put out there. And so okay. if you have someone on your team, I mean, at least it shows you that it's very good thing that you have someone working along with you, that you feel comfortable to reproduce their work and they know right. exactly how you work as a, as a contractor. So right. I'm sorry for straying away from the whole um, framework of how it works, but I just, because you spoke about that, it just nudged me about finding out. You know, and, and um, just to add this in, um, my architect um, is a female, and it's so funny how I've compared her work with some of, my, some of the male counterparts I've worked with. And I find it to be very detailed. Uh, in fact, I took one of her drawings into planning um, here, and they they actually elaborated on the fact that they've never had a drawing so detailed. I mean, in fine tune. But I found out. Uh, I don't know. It's I hate to sound like this, but same so a lot, women are very intuitive to details. We are um, more 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 than. Um, some of the male architects I've worked with. Well, that's a good thing. It's a good thing. Yes. Very good. Yeah. So basically, so now you start from the consultation process for someone. And then, like you say, you recommend them to an architect. And what's the next step? OK. Um, then we look at the cost of drawing, doing the drawings. Um, and I normally, like I said, I work with this architect because She's very reasonable, okay? Um, she gives you a um, million dollar dream for pennies. So you have, some, you have a product that, you know, you put your bells and whistles without having to pay astronomical um, cost for it. Okay, so when we get to that part of doing the drawing, then um, if they, the client likes it, then we have to have a, have a quantity done to do a material takeoff to know what it's going to cost to, um, in terms of material. Mm -hmm. And then once we know that, then we have to know what it's going to cost for the labor construction side of it. Um, like with a construction firm, there's different levels of the way they price, okay? There's something called preliminary sum, then there's miscellaneous, um, there's uh, mobilization. Um, all of that has to be taken into context when pricing the job. So it's not just saying, okay, the materials cost this, the labor cost that, there's also a markup in terms of profit. Um, so all of that is done and then presented to the client to say, well, this is what you're looking at. Um, are you comfortable with this? Could you work with this? Now, if they quote and say, well, you know, my, you know, my, my um, expense that I want to get into is only like 250,000, then we try to work within that arena to see what we can give them for that. Um, and I always, especially locally, try to work with my people in the best way I can because I know 
these are hard times. And yeah, you know, I'm not one to try and think of get trying to get rich on the box of people that are trying to make it. I don't believe in that. I think we all need to to live together and try to do the best. Everybody want to have something nice and is able to give a bit more for for a penny. Why not? Right. <clears throat> right. Right. So so once once our material once our um quotas um completed, then um do they make a deposit? Um how does the process start from a construction standpoint? And so yeah. there are stage payments? Well once we come to agreement that we're gonna take the project on, then we go to contract where we decide how we want to do payments um you know different contractors do it differently they they can do payments of four stages excuse me um sometimes three um i tend to do do it in three and um the details of how we would do the payments you know we, we work that out and we take it from there of course, um, I believe in, you know, once things are done, it has to be done legally. So we get a lawyer in to make sure we have binding contracts. And um, once that's done, you know, I guess we're ready to go. And do you give a reporting on stage as this each stage progress? Uh, yes, most time, um, the architect comes in and do an evaluation um, on the job so that for the payment that you're requesting, we'll have to see um, that the job is up to that stage. So a schedule is done to say, well, okay, um, these, this should happen in this many weeks. And so the evaluation is done in the third week, they come in to see if all the things that should have been done, we able to get a payment come in. Um, those things are, um, are, are, you know, sorted out. Um, if you're not, if you're asking for payment and you're not, the, the delivery on the work is not done, of course, there won't be any payment. Right. Because whatever, you know, like I said, you have to, everything is legally done and goes to contract. So you agree that in a contract as well, you get paid based on performance. Right. No, that's very good to know because, you know, it's so hard sometimes when you're, you are not construction savvy, you want to know what it is that you should be expecting from a contractor. You don't want to just say, okay, I'm just issuing all the money and then the work isn't being done. But I like what you said about everything being in a contract form, legally binding stages, and you being able to assess to know exactly what's supposed to happen at each stage and the contractor has to be accountable for that. Um, I think it also goes a long way in making sure, like you say, the money is applied to what it's supposed to be applied to and getting the exactly. job completed. Because that's the main goal. You want a completed project. You don't want it to, exactly. unless some, um, like you say, miscellaneous happens during the construction phase, something that's beyond your control. For example, materials increase again in cost. You don't want mm -hmm. the project to have to be stopped because no. of something that's not um that can be avoided mm -hmm. and then doing your contract you know you need to also include those things in there i mean for instance um if there's a, if you have a time frame that you're supposed to finish but let's say it rains for two weeks and you can't get a day to work that needs to be in that contract and that should be looked at um as part of your delay and not work against you as the contractor. So, but you have to make sure that those things outline um, in your contract. Right. So, 
I just want to pause for a moment just to thank everybody for listening. Yes, we have with us uh, Mr. Herbert Swan, um, and today we are talking about building construction. Definitely let us know where you're listening in from. And also, if you have a question, please feel free to put it in the comment section. We will try our best to answer for you. If not, like we've been doing, we're almost ready to wrap it up. But we, I do have a, um, a few other questions that I would like to ask Mr. Swan that I think um, you would want to know about. So I would ask at this time, um, we always talk about building, but also we have persons who want to be more involved in renovation. So like from a real estate standpoint, we always have customers asking, okay, I would prefer to get a home and then I can do some renovations to that home instead of building from the ground up. Um, what would you, what type of advice would you give to someone who's looking to venture into renovations versus um, building from the ground up? I, I think that's, that's a good thing. You know, if you have an existing home and you want to do some extension, um, again, um, basically the same thing applies. You, um, you'd have to get planning permission, of course. So that means you also would have to probably get, um, not probably, you have to get an architect, some draftman um, person to do the extension so you can go and get your approval. Um, and so, Again, you have to be realistic about what it is that you're doing, how much money you want to spend and doing that. And, um, you know, I guess once you have all those things worked out, but renovation is also, um, you can take, you know, you can buy a home and you don't know what's behind those petition walls. I've, I've been in situations where, you know, you take down walls and I see a million roaches running for cover, you know, um, centipede and rats and everything all over the place. So renovation can be like opening a can of worms. You don't know. It's difficult to price a renovation job because you don't know what you're going to need, you know, and, and that, that is something that can hurt you as a contractor because I remember, um, you know, I'd price a job some years ago just to remove some plywood, change it. But after we remove, remove the plywood, we found out that all the um, supporting beams all rot. That was not price in the contract. You right. could not put plywood back on, same thing. And so you had a problem with the client saying, well, you should have thought of that before. But I said, but look, you told me what your budget was. We worked based on that. Now we're finding out that your place is going to fall apart. What do you want me to do? Do you want me to put the plywood right back on the way it is? No, I need my place to be fixed properly. So what you're going to do? Who's responsible to buy the extra material? I mean, who's going to pay for the labor time? So, you know, it can be tricky. And that is an area that I call a gray area that you have to be very careful of. Um, you have to price your job with a markup just in case you run into some problems. You can you can probably just break even if it comes down to it. But whenever it comes down to you spending money with your own pocket to finish, finish somebody else's job, I don't think that's the way you want to go. Right. So basically, for someone who as um, who the customer who is looking to renovate, they need to consider, like you say, the the um, the possibility that um, the job may not be as straightforward as it looks because you don't know, exactly. like you say, what's behind the, when you remove the wall structure, what's behind the renovation. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah, so sometimes we might think the renovation is the easiest way to go, but you, it, it dep you don't know what you're getting. No, you don't know, you don't it know. Could, it could end up costing you a whole house. <laughs> I was saying that too. I've seen that, you know, um, but it's not, you know, it's not something I deter people from not doing. If you, if you want to make changes in your home, right. then just go through the right channels and, and check. I mean, I would, I often say to people, listen, if, if you have some doubt, take your hammer, take your hammer and break your worksheet. See, check for yourself, see what's there before you know what you want to change and what, you know, that's going to be part of the process. 
to check for yourself. You know, you don't want a problem that um, with a contractor where they might have been willing to really help you out and you, you're just being hard nosed with them because they run, run into some unseen problem, unforeseen problems, and then you don't want to give them some easement, you know. I think it's better to, to build a proper relationship that um, both persons are happy at the end of the day. That is key, building a proper relationship between your cost, the customer and the contractor to make sure it's a good um, result at the end. Let me ask this question. Um, in terms of um, load bearing walls, how, I mean, how would you tell or know just by walking through a house if, if it or if it's not? I'm just asking because sometimes people buy homes thinking that, you know, we can just give it a clean slate, open concept look as they renovate. How would you tell, but I know that that's important to know if the, world, the wall is load bearing and can be, or can be removed. How would you be able to tell that just as a regular person? Or should you have your contractor just walk through your house with you to be able to advise on this type of information? Well, it all depends on, you know, load bearing can be from two angles. You, you're talking concrete and you also could be talking wood. Um, if you're doing, if you're, let's say a house that has a second floor, mm -hmm. um, all right? An engineer, um, they calculate what distance um, is allowed to have a load bearing column or, or, or partition wall, um, de depending on the size of the steel and also um, the distance that you have to cover. Mm -hmm. um, I remember one time we did, I did a, um, a beam coverage, which was, I think it was 42 feet. Um, yeah, 40, it was either 42 or 45 feet. There is no column. In fact, I can tell you the building. If you go in Brayton Hall and you look across that stretch, you will not see any columns in the middle of the floor. The columns, the, the load is supporting on, on the outside beams. But if you look at the distance of how wide that beam is, um, but the engineer calculated how much support or what struck size steel you would need to stretch over 40 feet without having columns in the center. Most time you'd see a church or building and every 20 feet, they'd put up a column to say, hey, we need to support this so it doesn't sag or crash. Um, going to your question, how would we know um, it's a bearing, um, support bearing? As long, let's say, for instance, um, it's, a, it's a house that has partition walls with rock sheet, and you have a roof sitting on that. Wherever you have um, stud walls set up, most likely the roof is sitting, the truss is sitting on top of that. And that's gonna help support the roof structure. Okay. So whenever an architect draw the layout drawings, they lay it out so that the partition walls become support bearing walls for the roof. Okay. As I said in the in the cases of um, a concrete roof, um that also has to be decided and those are placed strategically depending so that you have what we call shared bearing support so the weight is um the weight of the roof is proportionally distributed on these columns so it doesn't sag or you know fall in right yeah so once you see that um you would know you can't go and remove these columns um just like that. Now, there have been cases where people, where you have some columns that um, have some structure issues. Mm -hmm. And so what people would do, um, some contractors, they would actually support that floor with jacks. You know, they have um, the skinny pipe looking things. Mm -hmm. We call them jacks. We support the roof. Um, and then we take um, the column out. You know, we could actually remove that column, re reset the footing, and then 
break a portion of that roof, tie the steel, the rebars back into the main roof, and then we can recast that. So you can replace those without having to, you know, mess with the whole integrity of the, the structure. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I don't know if all that stuff makes sense, but no, I'm trying to, to explain it to I you. understand. Yeah, but I understand where you're coming from. It does make sense to me. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's, 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 that's good information. So let me just say to you, I mean, just let me, so far the conversation has been really good. Uh, we are actually at the, um, past the time where we're supposed to stop but you know when you're talking about something you are passionate about you don't even realize that the time has passed so um, before we uh, wrap it up i'm going to give you an opportunity if there is anything that we did not discuss in terms of building construction that you think is very important or if you just want to give some closing remarks please use this opportunity to do so okay thank you very much Mr. Delancey. well one of the things that i wanted to address with our contractors and even um, the Turks and Caicos Island at large. Um, I don't have a problem with all of the big developments coming into the country. I am happy about that and invite that. And I, I would love to see more of it. Um, but I do have an issue. I, I believe that having all the major development happening, but there's not really um, our people is not benefiting from that. Um, where I think they should um, or could be. I, I do have a problem with that. And, and one would answer, what's the problem? Well, for instance, I believe if there's a major construction coming to the island. And I don't think we have to have that company bring in foreign workers. I think the power should be given to the local contractors that they have the ability to um, get work permits to bring in people in specialized areas. I, I think that the whole idea of developing a country is uh, empowering your people. I think you, it's about building wealth. I think when you energize your people and, and you have contractors who could get a bigger piece of the pie instead of just the loaf and somebody else has the bakery. I think you could, I mean, if I can word it like that, I think that it's time that our people, our contractors get a bigger play, bigger portion of, of some of the development that's going on in the country. Have, have a more hands-on, if you want to put it like that, as opposed to just been given a little piece here and there. Now, one would think that I have a personal issue, but it's not that. It's just my observation that I think in this day and time, we should be looking at wealth building among our people um, so that later on, if there are things to be done in the country, we can count on these same people who's been given opportunities to make money to say, hey, you know what? We need to build a recreation center for our kids and these contractors can come out, put some money forward. They can um, um, give maybe, 15% of their workforce of build these places. This is just my observation. I just think that in this day and time, the Turks and Caicos Island, that um, we should be supporting local contractors with an umbrella company or a company that's able to say, these guys can do the job. You know, we're gonna stand behind them and we're gonna put up the performance bond. So, so you know, and you know, the government, I know, I don't wanna say government, but the government has a hard job. And when I say that, if you look at all of the development that's on the table or pro that's proposed to come or people that wanna come into the country and build, if you would allow every Tom, Dick and Harry that wanna come to Turks and Caicos and develop to just come right in, we would be in trouble. And when I say that, um, you know, we'd be like our, our neighbors that you have people coming and spending hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars and all of a sudden the burden of having to pay these people back or whatever is on the back of our next generation. Um, people that want to come in and say, we're going to give you half a million dollar, billion dollar loan, and we're going to do this and do that. And because we're all excited to see Turks and Caicos all built up, we say, yeah, 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 let's go and get it, man. Let's stop looking like we are first rate world country or whatever. But at the same time, I think that that we are 
delusional in the fact that we don't see the, the damage that can happen long term. I love the fact that at this point, I don't think I've seen nobody, you know, just rushing and trying to build, 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 build. You know, everything is being kind of proportion, giving people time to catch up. Because if five major projects came to this island all at once, we would not be able to deal with it. And certainly we would have to be bringing in hundreds of people. And a lot of these people are not going to want to go home. They don't want to be here. And we, we're going to be in a situation where we are already a small group of people, but we're going to be fighting for survival. And I, I am not trying to sound difficult or, you know, like I'm hitting on anybody, but I'm, I just, just my observation. And I think that as a people, we need to start thinking a little more. Um, we need to be a little more focused with where we want to see this country move. Our contractors need to get more serious about creating um, uh, our associations and, you know, putting things in perspective. And, and we need to look at creating more vocational um, training um, places that are going to train our guys to be good carpenters, electricians, and other areas that we need. I suppose every time we have to be bringing outsiders in to do what we can do. And so that's just my take. I am sorry if I kind of mashing anybody toes, but I'm just saying that if we don't um, manage what we have to be good stewards, what we have, we will lose it. And we have to think about that because nobody's going to come in. Um, there's no free lunch. Nobody's going to come in to do what we should be doing. And if we don't get our act together, you know, we could, we could be heading on a path that we don't want to go. That's my two cents. Well, thank you so much for your comments and thank you for your contribution. And definitely, again, thank you for, um, I mean, accepting the invite to come on the show and sharing with us. Um, I'm uh, happy I, to be here. Thank you. I've actually, I've, 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 I always learn when I come on these shows because remember, that's not my field of expertise. And so just having an opportunity to ask these questions and receive the answers, it helps me also as an individual to advance and to be more able, well-versed about and talking to customers about, I mean, subjects like this. And it's always good to have a professional in the field and view today in building and construction to be able to clear up a lot of these answers. And so I'm going to ask you at this time, if you can just leave your contact details, perhaps there is someone out there who does require your service as a general contractor with your expertise, please do so so that they can reach out to you directly with any opportunities or questions in this regard. Okay, my, um, my email is um, swanherbert69 at gmail.com and my phone contact is 347-5674, area code 1649. Just repeat your email one, sorry, just repeat your email one last time and if you can spell it for them, just because to make sure we're getting it correct. Okay. S W A N N Herbert H E R B E R T 69 at gmail um, dot com. And the phone number of course is three four seven five six seven four. Thank you. So once again, I would say um, thank you once again for being on the show. And I also would like to say to everyone who have listened and tuned in, thank you for listening as usual. And as usual, I would say um, stay safe and remain blessed. See you next time on Let's Talk TCI Real Estate. Have a very, very good evening. Good. The views, thoughts, and opinions expressed on this show belong solely to Let's Talk TCI Real Estate and not that of Keller Williams TCI or any of its affiliates. Any action you take upon the information provided on this show is strictly at your own risk and Let's Talk TCI Real Estate guests or hosts will not be liable for any losses and damages in connection with the use of the material. I am not an investment advisor, broker, or dealer.